I like the sound of it. Like it sounded like a really good form of education. Um, like a, when, when it became an option, when there was a group that formed that um, were talking about it, I did some research on it and uh, it looked it looked like a good thing to do. And uh, I'm, I'm always up for sort of new adventures and it seemed like a, an exciting thing to do to sort of start a school, um, particularly because there was sort of like a band of people who I knew from play groups who were sort of really keen for it. And so the idea of doing it as a collegiate thing uh, was really appealing to me. What were the particular aspects of the education in your research that you found that that you liked? I like the idea of um, the education system not changing channels on the kids on a regular basis. Like uh, it seemed to me from my limited uh, experience of kids, but um, that they have a great capacity to focus. Like, you know, when you get, if you get them interested in something, they can just, they, they can really stay on that subject for a long time. Their little, you know, inquisitive brains can sort of latch on and stay. So the Steiner system where there's a main lesson, which is <clears throat> the main thing that they do for that day. And there's a sort of other activities based around it, but basically one serious topic of education per day struck me as a really, a, a much better way than the, the standard curriculum of, you know, half an hour of this, half an hour of that, half an hour of this. When you actually, you and Patty, I guess, experienced the Steiner School, how did it match your your expectations? Because it was in those days, it was just starting off and there was that um, collegiate and communal kind of atmosphere, which was great, but it was also some uh, pretty... Uh, you know, it was a rough start in a way, just keeping things going, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was, um, but we again had a really dedicated sort of first teacher who uh, was pretty inspiring and uh, the kids really loved her. And uh, it was, um, so it was the, the fundamentals of the classroom, you know, the dynamics between the teacher and the kids was really strong. Um, so it, you know, it was, it was okay. We didn't really, like it wasn't a, it wasn't a really flash classroom. Hey, it was like in the in the old um, folk folk club at the behind our lawn. Um, but it was adequate for what we what we needed for the very small number of kids who were starting off. And those kids were sort of like a band of friends anyway, because they'd been basically most of them had been connected up through the through the play groups that the Steiner School grew out of. Um, so the school dynamic was uh, was quite quite good. And you got involved with the education of those kids pretty early, Blair. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I was um, fortunate enough to be working part-time for a number of years in those early days. And so I had a lot of scope to go and help out at the school. Uh, I became a regular for the particularly going to the swimming pool. Like I was, it was always good to have a few extra eyes when you had kids in water. So I sort of like would... Um, would go along to to the pool with them and we'd swim around and it was really really quite delightful um and i sort of occasionally did other things um i, I taught them we made drums and i taught them some drumming stuff which ended up and we ended up getting a couple of the steiner kids joining my um belly dance troupe as drummers which was right. really fun <laughs> tell us a bit more about making the drums what did that involve um it involved um getting um very heavy cardboard tubes and uh leather and um and glue <laughs> it was very straightforward really so we the kids all just um decided on a length of a length that they wanted for their drum and we'd cut them up and then we sort of then you wet the wet the leather and then you put it on wet uh and with some glue around the around the perimeter and squeeze it on and tie it on in the beginning and then you leave it for a couple of days and it dries to a drum skin. And there you've got a drum. And then I, I taught them um, Middle Eastern drumming rhythms. Uh, Middle Eastern rhythms are quite different to Western rhythms because they, they've got a sort of, they're, they're not on a 4-4 four, four time. They work on a 3-5 three, three, time. And so the drum rhythms sort of have a real action about them, you know, like. Um, sometimes drums, you know, in Western music sound, you could replace it with a drum machine and you wouldn't notice it's pretty me mechanistic, but, um, Middle Eastern rhythms are much more interesting. So I taught the kids 
um, Middle Eastern rhythms and maybe and a few a few dance moves, but um, mostly it was the drum stuff. They were receptive, and um, it was a small small group, and um, they they seemed to like me. So that was that was all a good dynamic. So it all worked really well. It fits in very well, of course, with the whole Steiner philosophy of of process. I guess of you don't just sort of go down the shop and buy some drums and, and learn them. You actually mm. make the drums in the same way that, you know, you get involved in gardening. You start with the seed, you make the soil. Mm. It's that whole idea of process. Was that something that that you liked about Steiner education too? Yeah, it was. Like I, I've still got, like, and I like the way the Steiner kids made their own textbooks. Um, and I've still got some of the some of the textbooks that Patty made when he was in that are just literally quite beautiful and um, is 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 like he never pursued an artistic thing pretty much since he left Steiner. But you could, which is so I'm really so happy that Steiner put that in his path in a systematic way because um, I think some of his some of his work is quite extraordinary. I think he's got a really amazing eye um, and uh, and his uh, textbooks reflected that so mm. it was uh, yeah a real delight to me to look at all him and all the other kids and their books and they it was as you say it was like a do-it-yourself version of education they didn't go and buy buy textbooks or or have photocopied coloring in things <laughs> they launched into it and created some remarkable stuff that is like a mm. is like a fragment of their childhood still you know it was their own own unique sort of like personal creations that they that they made and and, um, and learned from so um yeah i'm really pleased to still have a bunch of them lying around so what do you think was that the legacy the long-term legacy of going to a steiner school for patty and i guess for any of the other children that you knew can you put a finger on that or you know um i was actually just talking to patty and Lilith. Um, about this morning, both of them went through the Steiner thing, and I asked them what you know for their perspectives on it. And Lilith, at one stage, left the Steiner school and went to another high school, uh, another primary school for a period. And um, he said the thing that he found really difficult to transition was the authoritarian nature of the other schools, uh, which was not how the Steiner school was. And like it reminds me of what Marshall McLuhan, that you know, educator. Um, American educators said in the 70s that schools basically are there to teach you to sit down and shut up and do what you're told. You know, that the, that the medium was the message and the medium in, in standard schools is basically obedience. The school system on the whole is a 19th century artifact, which was designed to sort of create compliant clerks uh, for sort of administrative systems that required you to sit down and shut up, and do boring tasks over and over again as accurately as possible. It wasn't to create to create people with creativity or foster creativity. It was about creating a particular sort of trained person for a particular sort of um, economic need at that time. But times have shifted, but the education system hasn't. And starting to look like an opportunity and proved to be an opportunity to foster some sort of creative urges in, in the kids rather than sort of just obedience and compliance and you know, accurate renditions of of um of tables perhaps that that um that basic model that uh you know th that came out of the industrial revolution is very mm. hard to tweak you know and and despite the best intentions of of teachers and educationalists they're stuck with that kind of assembly line model perhaps yeah and no, i think that's why it's failing in the aboriginal domain i think that the um yeah the the the, the Kids are kids and parents are voting with their feet in relation to how, how valuable the Western education system is. Um, I'm not saying that um, that Steiner is a sort would be a sort of you know panacea for that, but um, it's certainly like it's it's certainly the standard education system doesn't doesn't really work anymore. And I think there I've read some books about about the American the American experience where basically about a third of the kids have to be sedated in order to sort of ma manage to sit through the classrooms, uh, you know, with the sort of rise of antidepressants and ADHD medication and all of those things. Basically, the, you know, the problem is the system, but the solution is drugging the individuals who are inside that system. 
Wow. So yeah, I think that I think that Steiner and Steiner and Montessori and some other alternative education modes that actually were created in the 20th century um, are much better for kids to sort of learn because you don't need computers are doing all of that stuff. Any you know the stuff that used to, used to be so valuable for kids to learn to become clerical people. Um, that's all done by machines now. And what we really need is creative people. And uh, yeah. the standard education system just doesn't seem to foster it. And yet my observation was that the, that, um, the kids got a, a, a strong grounding in, for example, mathematics and, mm. um, and other aspects in which perhaps, you know, create creativity can spring out of, the, it, but they, it gives them some materials some, or some tools that they can work with in that mm. creativity. Yeah, sure. Like the basics were not neglected in the Steiner School. And uh, I asked Patty and Lollop about that this morning too. And they said, I said, what was it like transitioning from Steiner into standard education? Lillip went to a high school and Patty went to another different high school. And um, they both said that they ended up sort of in advanced classes uh, once they hit the standard education system because they they just had learned all those basics really strongly and had uh, and so they had really good maths and they had really good spelling and they had you know um, good language skills and so yeah the science school certainly didn't did equip them with all the basics and uh, they certainly as well as creativity so I think you can you can do both. Just one more thing I wanted to ask you about, and that was you were quite well known for, for your activities in preparation for the Stein Affairs, Blair. What do you, can you tell us about? Oh, yeah. Um, I did two basic things. Like one, one thing I did, and probably the most useful thing I did, was get my wife, Jenny, to come and read tarot. Like as soon as she set up her tarot stall, there was a line of people and they were just out there. She was all day. She was reading tarot. It was just the perfect thing for the Steiner school. And uh, she's really good at it. And I, for a while, uh, Patty and I ran a chess club, which was oh, a chess, chess games. And it was like a dollar a game or $2 if you want to win. So kids, <laughs> kids would come and give me $2 and then I'd play chess with them. And I'd let them win and they'd be, oh, I've never played so well. <laughs> but as I recall, there was also some gathering of of, of vital materials in the bush before the oh. fair. Yeah, yeah. Like so, we also introduced archery as a sort of like thing, which is again on that Steiner principle of you know we didn't just you know give them a bow and arrow and say yeah where's your little sister have a shot. <laughs> we um, <laughs> we, um, we me and some other parents would go out in the bush and find. Find, find the right sort of wood, uh, a springy sort of like, you know, wood of the right length and size and uh, collect feathers and collect up uh, bamboo shafts. And then, we, so we'd have this big pile of crap at the um, at our stall and people would come over and we would make bows and arrows. You know, the, 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 their kids and sometimes their parents would come and we'd, you know, string the bows and uh, and then we'd make arrows, really blunt arrows out of, uh, out of um, um, uh, bamboo, and we'd fletch them with fe with feathers, with real feathers, and uh, and then you know then and kids would make make a bow and arrow and three bow and three arrows, and uh, and they'd have they were allowed to have a couple of shots just to sort of try it out, um, uh, and then we'd put it put them and we'd tape it up, tape it with uh, paper tape their little collection up and put their name on it and leave it, and they could get it when they were leaving the Steiner School Steiner Fair. So, uh, yeah, we did that for quite a few years. It amazed me that the Occupational Health and Safety <laughs> were allowed us to do that. But there you go. And that, that worked well. Uh, and also, in the last couple of fairs, I also did um, um, drawing. Like, I would draw portraits of people. And that was heaps fun. Like, the, I like doing things where I derive a lot of enjoyment from it as well. So, I would, I had a, I set up a stall and I just would, people would come up and you know, give me a dollar and I would do sketches of them, like, you know, and um, give them to them. They would, they would seem happy when they'd come back with their friends and get portraits of all three of them together and things like that. So, um, yeah, that was just a sort of, you know, crafty, arty sort of thing that I could contribute and, and enjoy. How fantastic for you to have had that experience of being involved, so deeply involved in your own child's education, which 
to so many people is is just a separate part of their of their children's lives mm. from which they're completely cut off. Yeah, I feel sorry for like I see like I was going down the gym the other day and I saw the um you know the working parents dropping the kids off to the childcare because they had to work and there was no school and so the kids were you know they looked like they were going to school they had their backpacks and their hats on and they were sort of going into another institution and I thought you know it is it's our, our social institutions these days do make it difficult for parents to be involved in their you know as I said, I was fortunate enough for a number of years there to be um, working part time, so I had plenty of space and time for for that. And but I understand that economic forces are sort of you know reducing parents' capacity to spend time with kids, and sometimes it seems like you know they get the kids up and put them in childcare, and then they go to school, and then they go into after school, and then they bring them home and give them a bath and put them to bed, and, and then repeat. It's it uh, it re really reduces the amount of time the kids get to engage with their with their family which is um which is a shame and it's becoming you know it's not not the usual way human beings are raised that's for sure 